Uh, my name's Dennis Martin, I'm an IT guy. Uh, 40 years in IT. Uh, the most recent thing is I had a company in Colorado, which I started from scratch, built it up, got employees, got the whole thing, sold it to a larger competitor here in North Carolina, which is why my wife and I now live here. <coughs> so let's just get going. So we're gonna talk about the design of the universe, just a trivial little topic. <laughs> As I was putting the notes together for this, I thought, oh, this is going to be multiple parts. <laughs> There's just so much to cover. Uh, but let me talk a little bit more about what else I do. Uh, I'm the chapter president for the Raleigh RGB chapter um, of Reasons to Believe. And so you can see, I won't read all of this to you, but uh, we talk about science and the Bible, topics that bring the two together and talk about why each one supports the other. And we, we have a number of topics, and you see a lot of STEM topics. Um, I, I give some of the presentations, but most of the time other people give the presentations. Um, yeah, you can see that there. Uh, here's our schedule for the next, uh, we meet on the second Friday evening every month. We meet by Zoom or in person. It's in person at our house in Cary, but you know Zoom works great from anywhere. Uh, and these are the topics we've got coming up. Uh, now, just so you know, this next month, March, I'm doing this presentation again. And so based on the questions you asked, I'm going to have to change it up. <laughs> okay. uh, at least for part one. But you can see the topics there. You can kind of see the spread of things. Sometimes they're scientific. Last month was the origin of light chemistry, <coughs> talking about chirality and information in cells and all that kind of stuff. And you can just see, and there's more uh, we've got coming, but I just thought you'd like to see that. If you want to get on the email list to receive the announcements, go to that website. It's fairly straightforward. There's a contact email, email account. And then come to me and then uh, we'll put you on the list. Again, you can attend in person uh, or you can do Zoom. You know, Friday night, date night, or whatever. <laughs> it's just kind of <laughs> All right, well, let's get into the, the meat of it here. Um, there are a lot of amazing coincidences. Uh, recent advances in physics and cosmology, people have started to notice there's a lot of things about our universe that just Boy, it's amazing that that worked out and this worked out. And there's a lot of that going on, um, particularly as it relates to supporting life, uh, not just any life, you know, anything from simple cell life all the way up to you know, human life like us. And in fact, not just human life, but the fact that we can, as we're not just animals, we can actually develop advanced technologies and do all kinds of interesting things like you know, Zoom, for example, and all the computers and stuff. <clears throat> a couple definitions at the bottom. All right, so the first thing we're talking about is something known as the surprise principle. How many have heard of that? All right, and before I go any further, how many, let's talk about majors here. Who's an engineering type? Science and engineering, all right? What about humanities, or music, or what else do we have? Teaching, I mean, medical, what, what do we got? Shout out your Business. Business, all right, cool. Business. All right. Yeah, I started out computer science and then I switched to business because I wanted to get some business stuff because I figured someday I'd own my own company, which as it turns out I did. All right, so the surprise principle, you'll hear about this. Let me just explain, this is at a high level and then I'm gonna get into it here. So this is about evaluating evidence that you have observed. So ev the evidence is already there, the observation has already been made, and now you have to decide what to do with it. All right, so this principle guides us to select the hypothesis that best fits the observation we made. It also helps us reject the hypothesis, the hypothesis that uh, would be surprising if this were true. If this hypothesis were true, we make this observation, we go, that's really surprising. I, that doesn't make sense at all. All right. So that's what the surprise principle is about. What's the best? What's the best hypothesis? And, and typically, we're going to talk about it in a, more formally in a minute. Uh, one other thing. This is not when you're surprised at some new idea, all right, that's not what this is. This is you've got an observation already in hand, and now you've got to come up with a hypothesis to explain it. Right? That's what this is about. All right, so let me give it to you more formally. For two hypotheses, we'll call them H1 and H2. The observation O strongly favors H1 over H2 if and only if the following two things are, are happening. If H1 were true, if the first hypothesis were true, you would expect O to be true. In other words, you would not be surprised by that observation. However, if H2 were true, 
then you would expect O to be false. I mean, that would be a very surprising uh, uh, hypothesis given that O has already happened. Right? So let me give you two examples. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait, one more thing. Um, this does not necessarily mean H1 is true. Just by, just by this itself. You still have the other data to maybe go there. But what it does say is H1 is much more likely to be true than H2. Right? That's really what this is. So again, it's not saying it's true, it's just more likely. All right? And that's why we always talk about if it's the best explanation. When we're talking about these kinds of things that are not simple deductive things that we have to think about. All right, so two examples. Here's the first one. Who have ever heard of the game of poker? OK. All right. So. The background for this example is a royal flush. All right? A royal flush is, I think most people know what a royal flush is, I'm, and I'm talking about it in terms of five card poker, no, no whole cards, just a regular 52 card deck, uh, nothing, nothing fancy. This is not seven card, although you could do seven card, the odds would be better, but this is the most difficult one, so that's why we're doing this one. These are the chances of getting a royal flush, all right? 649,739 to one, those are the odds. If you convert that into a probability, you get that number of about 1.5 plus 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so here's our observation. A player comes into the game, and he gets 10 royal flushes in a row. So I put the probabilities there. You know about how many taking probability or statistics? All right, so you know what you do there. You just multiply them, right? 10 of them in a row. And according to those parameters I got up there, so it's 7.4 times 10 to the minus 60 is the probability of getting 10 in a row. All right, so here's our two hypotheses. One hypothesis is the deck was stacked. All right, how many play poker, or at least we'll play poker, or any kind of card game like that? If someone comes into the game and they get 10 royal flushes in a row, are you happy about this? Are you going to be suspicious? <laughs> yeah. All right. The other hypothesis, H2 here, is not pure chance, normal stuff going on here. All right. So which of these two is surprising? Which one is not surprising, given that we have this observation of 10 royal flushes in a row? H2 is surprising. H2 is clearly surprising, given that we are H1 is clearly low. It's a deck stack. Well, yeah, of course, right? All right, remember that number on this, on this probability here. It's 10 to the minus 60 number. Remember, remember that number. All right, here's the second one. <clears throat> Just as a reminder, my name is Dennis Martin, so I'm in this one. All right, here's the observation. We're down at the beach, we're walking around, and there's this message written out with seashells that says, happy birthday, Dennis Martin. So that's the observation, right? All right, here's our two hypotheses. The first hypothesis says, hey, I'm visiting some friends at their beach property, and it happens to be on my birthday. All right, the second hypothesis is, there was a storm two days ago, and the storm and the wind and the tides formed that message. All right, which one of those would be surprising, given that we see this message written in the sand? H2 is clearly surprising, yeah, yeah. H1 makes perfect sense, right? So that's what we mean by the surprise principle. So as we go through all this, think about what's surprising and what would make sense given what we see, right? All right, we're going to talk a little bit about this topic called fine-tuning. How many have heard of this topic before? All right, you may have seen what I'm about to play here. I'm going to play this video. And you may have seen this one. down to atoms and subatomic particles. The very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value 
a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow life permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life per any range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant, a change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would, again, be light prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these and many other numbers have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he's hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, the universe must be light permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a light prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a light permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence to suggest that fine tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that, odds are, life-permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine tuning. Given the implausibility of physical necessity or chance, the best explanation for why the universe is fine-tuned for life may very well be it was designed that way.
A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The oppression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Anything surprising? Not for the surprise group, but let me say it this way. Anything new? New information? Did you know this before? I remember the first time I saw this, I thought, wow, I gotta look up some stuff here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any comments on what you saw there? Kind of crazy? Yeah, I never heard of the idea that it's necessary for the universe to have those constants. Some people try to claim that, but clearly it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it's like, was necessary for me to eat food, right? But right. I don't always and die. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, what yeah, the necessary option says it must be this way. It cannot be otherwise. That's what you said in the video. That's what necessary. So if you, we can talk about something unrelated to this, well indirectly related to this, we can talk about the difference between a necessary being and a contingent being. It's that same idea. Necessary must be that way. That's the idea here. So some people try to say that the universe, you know, all these settings in the universe are necessary, but it's not. All right. So what we're going to do now, we're going to take a very high level overview of this book. Um, and we're only going to go part of it because there's so much to cover. All right. So Hugh Ross is the founder of Reason to Believe. And he wrote this book recently, back in 2022, called Design to the Core. And so we're going to go through it. Uh, you can get it on uh, electronically on Kindle. You can buy it at any bookstore and that kind of thing. Uh, it's 374 pages of very heavy duty scientific stuff with lots and lots of citations, lots of references to NASA and all kinds of other places. And so we're going to take a look at this because it's, it's really interesting about the design of the universe. And when we talk about this book, um, we're going to go through this part, this much of the is actually quite a lot. Um, but there's a lot more in the book, so we're going to go through this part first. So we're going to talk about the universe's overall design features, and I'll explain what that is when we get in there. We're going to talk about super galaxy clusters. We're going to talk about galaxy clusters. We're going to talk about uh, galaxies, uh, galaxy groups, and, our, and galactic stuff. Uh, in another edition of this presentation, I'll go through the lower level things you know, below that. But this is what we have in the universe. So there, there are structures that are quite, quite large. And scientists have been observing these things, and they've started to see, oh yeah, there's a there's a structure here. It's not just random stuff out there. All right, so let's get a few definitions. Uh, I won't read through all of these, but these are all related to galaxies or groupings of galaxies. So the largest structure is known as a galaxy super super cluster, uh, quite quite large. Uh, and then you can see they kind of work their way down, and you can get down to galaxy here. And this. So you take galaxy and you figure you see all the stuff that it says there and multiply that by very large numbers to get those ones above it. <clears throat> Alright, so I'll let that sit for a minute while I grab and drink. Alright, any questions on what these are? Right. I'm sure you've heard of at least the Milky Way galaxy, and you've probably heard of some of these other ones. We'll get to that. Alright, so let's talk a little bit more about fine tuning. This is a uh, quote from the book, and, and most much of what I'm going to say is either quotes from the book or my paraphrase of what's in the book. So this is a quote, let me just read it to you. The fine tuning that astronomers observe indicates that even very slight alterations to the universe's characteristics would rule out the possible existence of physical life. Uh, and so that's kind of his version of saying what that video said, right? It's just like, this, this is not going to happen. And this includes single cell life, multicellular organisms, creatures like humans, and highly populated, highly technological civilizations. So even if there was 
enough to support life, let's just say very advanced monkeys or something, but all they did was do what monkeys do. What he's saying here is that there's even more that's already laid out for us so that we can develop technology and civilizations. So it's not just that animals are here, it's that we can do some things here. All right, now think about the surprise principle as I read this. If a pur purposeful tuner exists, it makes sense that, deep, that the deeper our search into the features of the cosmos, the more evidence of fine tuning this search will reveal. If no purposeful tuner exists, then a deeper search will reveal less and less specificity and intentionality. The fine tuner's attributes and purposes will either become increasingly clear or increasingly vague. Okay, so that's looking at it and say, hey, do we have a tuner or not? All right, so let's talk about some of these features of the universe. Uh, let me just read this quote. An abundance of evidence now indicates that if the cosmic mass, size, age, inflation, elements, and ratio of elemental abundances weren't structured exactly as they are, no one would be here to learn of them or ponder how they came to be. All right, so let me talk about a little science here. Everybody knows what mass means in the physics sort of sense. Everybody knows what uh, age, of course. Inflation, are you familiar with this? Inflation, that stuff that happened really fast in the first few seconds or minutes of the existence of the universe. And, and the ratio of elemental abundance, I'm going to talk more about that a little later. So that's the kind of stuff we're talking about here. All right, so let's take an example and let's discuss what the periodic table of elements would look like under different quantities of mass in the universe. You've already seen the periodic table, right? You know what we're talking about. You've had at least some chemistry. All right. If the mass of the universe were just slightly less than what it is now, this would be the table of elements. <laughs> Makes the chemistry classes go really easy, right? <laughs> you got hydrogen and you got helium. That's all you get. So one has an E and one letter. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> one has an E and you know, so one letter or two letters. That's all you get. Now, if the mass of the universe, the total mass of the universe, were a little bit more than it is, this would be the table of elements. So you start with iron. Right. All right, now, just for reference, this is the current table of elements, at least for all the naturally occurring elements. There are some elements above 94 that are man-made, and they have very short half-lives and all that, but just the ones that naturally occur. All right, so let's talk about what was missing in those two. All right? These are the things that were missing from the first two tables of elements. All the life essential elements were missing, all right, carbon, Nitrogen, oxygen, sodium, magnesium, phosphorus, you see the list there. All right, and of course carbon is key because carbon is a really important ingredient for chemis chemistry of life. Right? It's not the only one, but it's a really basic one. Also notice, have you seen Star Trek? Also notice silicon is missing. So some people have tried to postulate there's silicon-based life. In this scenario, even silicon isn't there. But generally speaking, despite the fiction story about silicon, the Star Trek thing with the silicon character and all that, you remember that one? Um, <coughs> silicon life is not really possible. Silicon based life is really not possible. But if you, even if you thought it was, silicon though is the basis for a lot of chemistry about rocks. Right? So you wouldn't even have rocks, or at least many types of rocks. You have some. You know, nice. There are some, of course, that are more metallic. But yeah. So you have a problem. So these are missing in this table of elements. So. Again, chemistry class would be a little easier, but of course, none of us would be in it. <laughs> so it's going to be no chemistry class. All right. <clears throat> now let's talk about this thing called elemental consideration. All right, let me just read this quote. Advanced life, whether we call it as we know it or as physics or chemistry allow, requires highly specified ratios of the abundances of the 94 elements in the linear periodic table. So those table of 94, it's not just that we have them, but they have to be in certain ratios compared to each other. So it's very specific. So just imagine this. Here's some set of equations. You got 94 variables. Go ahead and solve for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, can anybody here do that? I know I can't. <laughs> I mean, I was good at math, but that's a little much. There is somebody who can. All right. Now, here's one more thing. He uses, in the, in the book, he uses an example of the universe's exterior features, meaning all this framework that we're sort of talking about here. So he says, more than 140 different exterior features of the universe, including the values of the constants that govern the laws of physics, 
must fit within narrowly specified ranges. This reality reasonably points to a source with the capacity for intentionality, for deliberate, pur purposeful design and implementation. In other words, a creator who transcends the well-crafted cosmos. Now, that number, the 140 thing, we're going to get to at the end. And we're going to do some math for that. All right, so let's get into the actual structure. So the first one is called the Super Guide, the Cluster Laikia. That's the name. It's a Hawaiian name. This is. Uh, this is a, a large. This is the one we live in. This is the supercluster, the, the galactic supercluster that we live in. It, the Hawaiian name for it, interestingly enough, is Advanced Heaven. Uh, it's positioned in a really interesting area of the cosmos in that it's the least. It's in a least densely populated uh, galaxy supercluster, okay? among other supercluster around. There's a little more space around this particular one than many others. It has a unique structure, which we're going to get to in a minute. That's friendly to life. Um, the gravitational attractors, that means other, other planets or other stars or other, other galaxies, uh, in this neighborhood are op op optimally situated so as to make life friendly for one galaxy in particular. All right? And it turns out it's one of the smallest and least dense of the superclusters. All right? So where would you rather live? In a really crowded city or maybe out a little ways where you've got some room? Right? That's kind of what's going on here. Right. All right. Here's the problem with large, dense superclusters. Larger, more dense superclusters are tightly packed together and are in, in, inhospitable to physical life due to the intense state of radiation and strong gravitational disturbances. Yeah. Most of them, will, is, they're just in, inhospitable. You can't have life there. They also exert powerful gravitational attractions that can disturb long-term stability of galaxy clusters and even galaxies beyond their borders. So you got some really serious forces at work here, and they're all just going crazier, right? No super superclusters of galaxies are located near enough to our supercluster, our nearby superclusters, including Mount Lanakia, to pose a threat to life or possibility here. Right? So all the other ones are far enough away where all that radiation, all that stuff that's happening, is because of gravity, it's not going to bother us. However, if the whole universe were set up spaced out like that, no life could possibly exist. You have to have a certain mix. And so he talks about this, this right mix of uniformity versus non-uniformity and homogeneity versus non-homogeneity, right? So you can't just have it all the same. You gotta have a little bit of difference here, okay? Now here's the interesting thing. This particular uh, supercluster structure, he says this, it's the shape of, uh, resembles a stick insect or a praying mantis. This is unlike most other superclusters, which are just either spheroidal, 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 yeah, there we go, or ellipsoidal, meaning, you know, sort of circular, right? Either in a sphere or an ellipse, uh, ellipsoid, uh, and they're all jammed tightly together. This one in particular is different. Really interesting. All right, it has these filaments. These filaments are long, thin, spindly filaments, and that's crucial for hosting a life. There's just enough density of matter to fuel and sustain a certain rare galaxy type, this thing known as a large symmetrical spiral galaxy, which we'll talk about a little bit more, and it can sustain it for several billion years. This is not just, you know, happen briefly and then it's over. This is, you need this. And because they're long and well space, it's possible for one galaxy within one of those filaments to avoid the distorting effects of any of the nearby gravitational forces, right? especially from the ones with the other clusters in this uh, uh, supercluster group. Okay, uh, one of them is, the one we're in is called the Virgo cluster. Interestingly, this one also is different. Uh, it's a disc shape rather than a spheroidal, so it doesn't have the height. Uh, and it's much less dense than most other superclusters. It has the same filamentary structure in it, so things can be stretched out along these filaments. And of course, this makes it very convenient for hosting the advanced life. Okay, now there's something called the local group. This is our local group of galaxies right around us. There are no giant galaxies in this local group, only two well-separated large ones. Okay. And there's only a few dwarf elliptical ones around. This, this scarcity is a little bit unusual, but it does allow for structural longevity because it's stable. There's not a lot of other galaxies swaying around nearby 
it's kind of it's kind of there. I mean, yeah, there's some OSHA and other stuff going on. In other types of groups, most of them are being torn apart gradually because other galaxies are close enough that the gravitational force from this galaxy is ripping apart this other one. And there's lots of cool photos and stuff like that. Um, but if you live there, you don't want your house ripped up, right? <laughs> so that's what's going on here. All right. Our local group density is a little bit unusual in that its cores, uh, the density of this group is about 50 times less dense than the core of the Virgo cluster, which is the one we're in. And the group, in, the core within our group is actually empty. So that means that we've got galaxies that are, they're, they're not right next to each other and the core, because the core is empty, there's nothing in the center that's causing strange you know, gravity things or radiation going on. And, and the, two the two galaxies, uh, Milky Way and Andromeda, are far enough apart from each other that they're not hurting each other either. Let me just read this quote here. <clears throat> and MWG stands for Milky Way Galaxy. The unusual characteristics and history of our local group have allowed for the MWG, or Milky Way Galaxy, to maintain its central bar and highly symmetrical spiral arms with only a few spurs and feathers between them throughout the past 10 billion years. This new study shows that the stability of the spiral structure has been maintained for many billions of years, primarily because our galaxy has maintained a strict diet of Milky Way clusters. It has consumed dwarf galaxies of the just right elemental composition and just right mass at a just right rate. Now in the book he goes into what this means in more detail. So small galaxies get sort of subsumed by larger ones. And so there are some dwarf ones near the Milky Way galaxy and they get subsumed. And what that means is all that material then gets sucked into this one and then as it moves around it spreads it out. So we, the material that's interesting is some of the heavier elements like some of the metals and all that because we need that for life. And so some galaxies are, are big enough, they, they sort of, he, he does this, he uses this term, we'll see it later on, where he talks about they gulp these galaxies, and then a little while later, and then it's quiet for a while, and then they gulp another one, and they gulp out. Uh, he's gonna say later here that this one is more, it's just like a constant little sip. It's just taking a little bit of time, and it's just nice and easy and very stable, and that's what's going on here. And it's doing it at just the right mass, at just the right rate. There's all this just right stuff that's happening in the Milky Way galaxy. In fact, let's talk more about that. All right, it possesses many or dozens of unusual and unique features important for its life. Uh, characteristics observed in no other galaxy among all the carefully studied, all the ones studied by astronomers. The most, and these are the most, I won't list all that, you can read that, but there's a whole list of things. And everything appears to be just right in the Milky Way galaxy, and it's unusually so compared to the other galaxies that people are studying. And you do see this thing about supermassive black hole, we'll talk about that in a minute. Even the galaxies that are considered the most similar to the Milky Way prove to be, as it turns out, different. He uses the term, uh, word starkly different. They're different substantially enough that, yeah, there's stuff unique going on here. All right, so here's a photo. This is actually, I should say, this is not a photo. This is a constructed face-on map, this was done by NASA, of what the Milky Way would look like if you were looking at it from the top or, or maybe from the bottom, whichever space, it's kind of up and down, it's kind of different, right? Uh, and that dot in the middle is where we are. Now, if you look carefully with that dot, is we're in kind of a space between two arms. We'll talk about that in a minute. So that's what it looks like. Just take a nice look at that. And in the middle, there's a core with, with kind of a bulge, and then there's the two sections. That's that bar. They use that the bar structure. And so you have this bar in the middle, and then you have the spiral arms coming out. So just look at this picture. It's kind of a nice looking picture. All right, so we have some unique characteristics here. I'm just gonna go through these. Uh, the ratio of mass is lower than other ones of this type by half. It's interesting. Uh, has a much smaller disc scale length. The disc scale is that stuff in the middle, and it looks like a disc with kind of a little bulge on either side. It's smaller in this case. Well, uh, again, about half, or to double the double. Um, yeah, it'll come to you, don't worry. <laughs> Hold glasses, though. I guess I don't have any things for your colors. Um, okay, I, I looked at that number, I said 108 years, that's not right, it's 10 billion years. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, yeah. Um, 
the outskirts, the outskirts star. So out on the edge of the galaxy is where it's most likely to be affected by other things around, moving around. And he says here, um, there's no, I like the way you, I like this term merger event. Okay, business major, you know what a merger is, right? Yeah. All right. I sold my company, so that was a form of a merger. I sold my company to a larger company. So that's not, not an equal, a merger of equals, but at least it was kind of a, you know, M&A activity. Merger is when two things come together. Now, in this kind of world, when you have a merger happening, you've got a lot of force happening and a lot of explosions and gravity ripping on other things. So mergers are not friendly here, <laughs> okay? Uh, what he's saying here is no large uh, merger event. And so they measure things, and the astronomers measure things by uh, relative to the Earth and the sun. So they'll say things like one astronomical unit. That's how far we are away from the our sun. So they say all the other ones, they say, well, that was two astronomical units away, or it's half of whatever. So everything's that. And then there's all the masses of the sun. So everything's relative to our sun. So they're saying nothing more than a billion solar masses, as we're talking galactic level here. All right, nothing that big has happened in 10 billion years. At least that's the way it looks from the evidence we have, all right? And by contrast, spiral galaxies of the similar mass have had lots of them in that same time period. Interesting that ours didn't get as many accidents as the other didn't get as many accidents as the other guys, right? Uh, and in particular, the, the key thing here is no mergers have happened of significant magnitude that would alter uh, anything that would help our galaxy be suitable for life. Right, so you can have some mergers, and, but if it doesn't occur anything, that's right. Um, and here's where he talks about the whole sipping versus gulping, all right? All right. A spiral structure and stability are essential to the possibility of advanced life, right? It doesn't mean you will have advanced life, but if you don't have that, you won't have advanced life, right? Okay, here's a photo. Here's another thing to think about. This is called the spiral arm pitch angle. This is the angle at which those arms come off the circle. That is also critical, as it turns out. Right, you see two examples of you know, slightly different angles there. Right? The smaller the pitch angle, the more massive and the, the more you will have a more massive central black hole. A high massive central black hole, of course, has lots more radiation that will reach further into the galaxy and has the possibility of messing things up, especially with radiation. Right? Also, the closer the arms will be. <clears throat> and so the any planets between the arms are going to get more affected by what's going on in those other arms, those other stars, those other planets, whatever, mostly the stars, right? And so you get extra UV radiation, which you need a little bit of, but you don't want too much, right? I'm a perfect example of that, you know, looking at my skin color, I get sunburned really easy, so I have to be very careful about UV radiation, right? Uh, now, however, if you get too large of an angle, then because it's a little further out, then it's more easily disrupted by other things going on nearby. And so that'll rip things apart either. So you have to have just the right angle on those arms to come off the circle. All right, so here's an, here are the advantages of spiral arm galaxies. Galaxies without spiral arms are non-candidates for life due to the high density. So you have high density, that means you've got radiation and all kinds of radiation going through, you've got gravity going through, and if it's too thick, it's too much, it's just it will kill life. Life can't even get started. Right. Uh, you get er erratic planetary orbits, frequent bombardment. Bombardment means you know, comets or asteroids hitting planets and stuff. That's what bombardment means. Um, and they grow very large, supermassive black holes that generate deadly radiation. And of course, the larger the black hole, the further out the radiation will go. Uh, given that the existence of advanced life requires a long continuous history of less advanced life, galaxy that could possibly host advanced life must maintain its stable spiral structure for at least several billion years. It's got to be stable. All right, a couple more things here. Galaxy color. It turns out they talk about galaxies and their color. Right? Uh, not just color of light, but the color of the whole galaxy. They kind of put it all together. So most galaxies are described as either blue with predominantly young hot stars uh, or red with predominantly older cool stars. The Milky Way is neither red nor blue, but they call it green because it has both blue and yellow, but not very many red. Right, so you got stuff that's generating, new, new hot stars are generating material in the universe. The old ones are not generating that much. So green galaxies are rare, as it turns out, 
but exactly the kind required for the possibility of advanced life. The Milky Way lacks either very many old, it lacks many either very old stars or newborn stars. It's in the middle of a transition from a star forming galaxy, which is with the young end, to a stable galaxy. It's no longer predominantly building the components for life, but it's sustaining advanced life. So, oh, there's another term you see here, but. So, ours is one of those rare ones. Hmm. I wonder how that happened. All right. <coughs> All right, another thing luminosity. The Milky Way is considered under luminous compared to other galaxies of its size and mass, which protects the Earth from. Excessive radiation. I mean, under luminous means not as much starlight, which means not as much stars, right? It turns out this low luminosity allows astronomers on the Earth to discover other things because it's not so much light. How many of you have ever lived in a big city? I've lived in New York City, I've lived in LA, other big cities. If you go downtown where the lights are and you look up at the sky, how many stars are you going to see? None, maybe, maybe one if you're, you know, if it's fortunate. But if you go out in the country where there's no lights, or you go out in the ocean or something, look up, you're going to see a lot of stars. Same thing going on here, right? Uh, on, a, on a galactic level. Uh, but it's interesting that our Earth and our galaxy are in just the right spot. So not only are we safe from all the radiation from coming from everywhere else, but the light's low enough that we can see out. So that's what you're going, well, how did that happen? <laughs> so, all right, let's talk about black holes. Uh, supermassive black holes. Uh, this is the term they use for the black holes. There are black holes at the center of pretty much every galaxy. There are other ones elsewhere, but uh, this is what we have here. The mass, of course, is, is extremely important. So this explain, you know what black holes are, right? So black, a star explodes, all this stuff happens, and it starts sucking it all in. And so what they say is inside the black hole, it's total chaos because you have gravity and uh, radiation just going everywhere. And, but it's also going out. Whereas outside of the black hole, you have a somewhat orderly universe, right? So it's total chaos in the black hole. Well, black holes like to consume, right? They just keep consuming. And the more stuff that's nearby, the more the black hole consumes, which means the event horizon, which is the edge of where the black hole sort of reaches, keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It turns out, in our galaxy, the, blast, the mass of the black hole is exceptionally low, and this is extraordinary and unexpected. If I just look at this, I'm going, wait a minute, why is R so low compared to all the rest of them we've seen? All right, it deviates significantly, so clearly something's going on here. Okay, here's, a few. The, the book goes through lots of details on all of these things. Uh, I can talk a little bit about them, I'm just gonna list them right here. I'm gonna stand over here because it's easier to see. <clears throat> the ratio of stellar mass to total mass. So inside a galaxy you have stars, but you have lots of other stuff. You have dust and glass or gas and planets and all that. So there's, a, there's ratios that you expect to have. Dark matter, halo, gas disk, right? So you've heard about dark matter, right? There's dark matter. Uh, this bar bulge structure, that's what we talked about, that bar in the middle with the bulge in the center. Uh, that structure is really interesting. Uh, we talked about the black hole. Inventory of elements, our galaxy has a better mix of elements that support life than other galaxies we've studied. You know, not only the carbon and the oxygen and all that, but also the heavier metals and all that, because we need, you know, our bodies need a little bit of iron, a little bit of all that other stuff, right? You talk about the dimensions, uh, the number of spiral arms and the pitch angle, all, all are very critical. The symmetry of the spiral arms, I'm gonna show you some pictures here in a minute about which, where you see that. The spurs and feathers. So these are these little extra little things. That if you look at an arm, you look closely at the pictures, you'll see other little stars or other dust and stuff going out there. You don't want too much of that. You know, you're gonna have some of it, but you don't want too much of that. And our Earth happens to be sitting in it, and our solar system is sitting in a good spot where we don't get too much of that. And then you want this green hue that you call it, the green color. So you want not blue and not red, but you want this green kind of thing. So you've got a nice mix of old and middle age. All right, so this picture here, these are actual NASA photos of other spiral galaxies that are similar to the Milky Way. So think back to the picture I showed before about how symmetrical the Milky Way is. And just look at these. And you'll see, like, let's go over, uh, let's look at, uh, let's see, this one here, all right? Uh, the arms are not quite as even and symmetrical, right? So, uh, and they've got these, these things right on the edges. So they're likely to be candidates to get affected by something else. 
Uh, this one, I mean, it's nice looking, but it's, you know, all of these just look, they just look good. This one here, it's one of these corner angles here. I mean, you know, so these are all similar. These are the ones, these are 12 of the ones that they, the NASA guys say these are similar. And yet, I don't, I don't think it's good looking. You know, and I'm just an observer here. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a astronomer. Right? Okay, let's transition a little bit. Let's think back to the stuff I said at the beginning. In the book, he references uh, this website, this page on their website, and I'm going to talk about that. On that page are four documents, and uh, I've downloaded them, and you can download them on the PDFs. And this, the first two of them, part one is called Fine Tuning for Life in the Universe, 140 parameters, and he lists all 140, what exactly that they are, all 140. That's for just any kind of life, like simple one cell life would be. Enough. You need those 140, you can even get one cell animals, or one cell life. If you want intelligent physical life, you've got to have a lot more stuff. And it turns out in the second document, they go through that. There are 402 parameters that have to be correctly present, and by that I mean the radiations and all that, in order to have intelligent physical life. Because obviously, you and I need more stuff than a one cell amoeba, right? We got more things going on. Document number three, now let's do some math. This is the one where they list some probabilities, all right? So, there are 501 parameters in this document that have to be, have to be met. The probability for occurrence of all 501 is 10 to the minus 333. But there are 10 to the 22nd possible bodies, meaning planets, in the universe that we've observed that could host those things. So in order to do the math, you subtract the 22 from the 333, and you get less than a one in 10 to the 311th chance, 10 to the 311th, exists that even one life support body, one planet, would occur anywhere in the universe without provoking divine miracles. All right, remember the, let's go back to the poker thing, 10 royal flushes in a hand, what was the number? 60. 10 to the 60th, or one, or one, 10 to the minus 60, or one over 10 to the 60th. How does that compare to 10 to the 311th? It's, it's it's less than chump change. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't even matter, right? This is what you need to get life. So how many uh, royal flushes in a row would you have to get to get to that? A whole lot, right? A whole lot. I didn't do the math on that one, but you can do the math and you can figure it out. All right? Document number four, for advanced life, 159 parameters. The chance of that happening is 10 to the minus 412. There are 10 to the 21st, four times 10 to the 21st places where that could potentially happen. So slightly less than the previous one. So you do the mass, you subtract the exponents. Less than one in 10 to the 390th that one planet occur would get for advanced life without some kind of divine intervention. That's the chance. Now, anybody here a gambling person and run people's odds? <laughs> All right. So using what we know of the surprise principle and the scale of probabilities involved for the complex requirements of advanced life, what sort of hypothesis would make sense of the increasing number of observations uh, we make where the parameters seem to be finally calibrated for life? Now, it turns out, if we had done this presentation, say, 20 years ago, they hadn't discovered all those parameters. So it used to be like there were like 12 parameters, and then it went to 20 and 50, and finally got to 140 on that first step. So years ago, the numbers were lower. So what that says is as we discover more, we're saying, oh, wait a minute, one more thing we got to figure in, one more thing we got to figure in. It's getting harder and harder. It's not getting easier and easier. So it's, it's going away from random processes and chance. It's going toward design. That's what's going on here. Now, uh, sometime later I'll do part two. This is what we're going to cover in part two. There you go. Uh, we're going to cover these things in part two, but there was just too much to cover, so we're going to do that. Now, I want to give you some additional reading opportunities. Uh, all three of these books are by E. Ross. The Design of the Core is his second most recent one, um, and these other ones here. A lot of what's in these first two, a fair amount of what's in the first two are in the last one, but there's some different stuff. So these are these are interesting reading. Here's two more interesting reading. How many are Christians? Many. All right, great. Uh, if you want to do science or Christianity, this is 
wonderful reference book. Uh, have you heard of this book or this person? Ethan Meyer, Turn of the God Hypothesis. This is a great book. Not an easy read. Uh, it's, I think, bigger than we will think. <laughs> um, heavy duty science, but explained so that a guy like me can understand. Right? I mean, I was pretty good in school, but uh, I'm a computer guy, not a rocket scientist. <laughs> Right. A couple other uh, recommended readings, uh, and I'll leave this up. And if you want this slide deck, I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, I do lots of stuff like this. I have at least 30 other presentations I do sort of like this. If you would like to see the list of those, if you're interested in those, or maybe somebody at your church or some other group wants to hear some of this, I'm available. I'm retired, or I'm mostly retired, so I got time. <laughs> okay. um, there's my email. Um, <coughs> Send me some email. Uh, if you want to get on the RGB email list, you can either send me an email there or send to the one that was on the other one. Go to reasons.org slash chapter slash Rob. All right, how are we doing on time? All right, good. All right, questions. Was this interesting? Was this new information, at least some of it? Yes. All right, cool. That's good. That's all I want to know. Yes, Julie. So, what we do a lot in our club is try and orient learn towards evangelizing people and presenting arguments and defending the faith. So yes. how is the fine-tuning argument and the intelligent design of the universe useful in an apologetics? Uh, okay, so that's a great question. So remember I asked you, when I showed, when I played the video, I asked you, was this new information to some of you? And a lot of you said yes. Just as many non-Christians don't know that either. Right? Uh, some scientists might know a little bit about this fine tuning thing. In that video, they play, they showed quotes from various people. You saw Stephen Hawking, you saw most of those quotes were from either atheists or agnostics. So scientists know there's something up here, but they don't want to go to where the obvious implication is, because that would mess up their whole worldview. Right? So just knowing the fine tuning, you can talk about that. You can say, hey, did you know this? How did this happen? You can do the portal flesh thing if you want, or pick your own examples. Um, What's more likely to happen? This, which we know about, or this crazy number that you know they've gotten at. Uh, one of them in the video, 10 to the 10 to the 123rd? Sure. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what is that? You can't even, there aren't enough zeros to write. I mean, it's more than the number of atoms in the universe. I mean, <laughs> that's how many zeros you have to have. I mean, it's, it's staggering. So that's what I, when I talk about fine tuning, most people don't know this. Uh, it's new. It was new to me, and I just learned this like 10 years ago. Um, and I've been a Christian a long time, and, um, and they typically don't go through this in church, right? You don't hear the sermons on this. <laughs> okay. okay, so the fine tuning is a great one. Now, of course, in the video, they will say, well, yeah, but what about the multiverse? That obviates the need for that. Well, it turns out there are four types of multiverses, not just four, but four types. Um, uh, so, but it doesn't get rid of the need for the fine tuning, right? Uh, and of course, multiverse is only mathematical theory. There's no science, right? There's no data. If you, we're in this universe, this is all we can see. We can't collect data from another universe uh, if one exists. Uh, I mean, no physical. You know, I mean, I was in an interesting conversation with a guy on Sunday, a new age guy, and he came to our church. And so someone said, You need to go talk to him. So I went and talked to him. And he said, Do you believe there are spiritual beings? I said, Yeah, there are. So I'm not talking about spiritual universes here. We're just talking about physical universes that science can measure. Right? But yes, that's, that's new information for a lot of people. Now, if you're going to get in that conversation, you will hear about multiverse. So you've got to study up on multiverse as well. Uh, and we've got, but our TV has a ton of stuff on, our, on multiverse. They have a special stuff. Four types of multiverse. Four types of multiverse. Can you go over that? Is that a whole presentation? Uh, I don't. Uh, all right, so the first type of multiverse is just, what they mean by that is, it's just our universe, but it's all that stuff beyond the observable universe that we can see, but still this universe. But they're saying all that stuff that's out there that could be different. Or right? even like way out there, we just can't see it. Right? Uh, in, this, in the book, he talks about the estimates are, the scientists have, that there are 15 million times more stuff beyond the edge of what we can see in this universe. Uh, a second type of multiverse is, yeah, there's another universe uh, maybe like a parallel universe or whatever, but there's another universe um, has slightly different laws of physics, you know, and constants and quantities. Remember in the video they talk about the constant quantities. So maybe the force of gravity is a little different in that universe. 
and maybe one of those might have life. And then there's the more complicated ones. And uh, Jeff's Weirich at RTB is, is, has some stuff on that. There's an article about that. So I could point to that. I just don't remember what the other two are, but it's, it's more complicated than that. Yes? So I think the most common objection to fine tuning is what's called the entropic principle, um, which basically states, well, look, of course, we notice that things are fine tuned to allow us to exist. Because if they weren't fine tuned, we wouldn't be here to observe it in the first place. Right. And so therefore, we shouldn't really be surprised to find that things are fine tuned to allow us to live because we're alive to observe it. Here we are. Yes. Right. So what would you say to that? So uh, he actually goes through that in the book. He uses the puddle. Have you heard the puddle analogy that people who say that use? There's, what they say is, uh, well, a puddle does not say that um, um, the water just happened to fit into this puddle. I'm, I'm just the water fits in this puddle because there's a hole, there's a pothole in the road. The puddle just perfectly fits in the hole. Amazing, how does that work? That's not what fine tuning is talking about, but that's the analogy they will use. He goes through that in the book, and I don't remember all the details of it, but if you want, I can put that up on the screen. Um, my glasses. Um, there is an answer to that, but what it's kind of circular logic that they're using by saying that because they're making a whole bunch of assumptions that you have that don't account for the stuff we've talked about. Um, I can I can get more on it, but I, I don't have it right in front of me. But it, it, it's, it addresses that in the book. And in multiple books it addresses that, but this, in this book it does specifically that one. Yeah, it's like the necessity thing we talked about at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? So I know there are um, two, I don't remember the names of the theories, unfortunately. One theory is that um, there is an event that could happen in the universe that would change the laws of the universe as we know them spontaneously. It's just something I unfortunately don't remember it, but um, and then there's also, I believe it was Hawking that said that towards the outskirts of our observable universe, the laws of our physics begin to change there. So how would that account for that observation? So I think what Hawking was doing was speculating because we can't observe the stuff out there. I mean, by definition, right? I mean, it's at the edge of the observable universe, right, so it's right. still within our area. Yeah, so I'd have to look and see what what specific things he's talking about, and I don't happen to know that off the top of my head. But you have to look at that and say, well, why is the, why are the laws of physics constant everywhere in the universe except right there? That would be the question I would have. Why? What's different? What's going on there? And I don't I don't know. I'd have to look at his at that comment to see. Yes, I don't know. Other questions? 